Welcome to Poudre School District's Living History. I'm Linda Lloyd. Our guest today is Lucy Burris. Welcome, Lucy. Thank you, Linda. It's a pleasure to have you here. Lucy is currently a PhD student at uh, Colorado State University in ecology. She also has recent degrees in archaeology and in her past, uh, degrees in mechanical engineering, engineering management, and operations research. What a vast history you have. Um, she, during her time studying uh, archaeology, has done a lot of volunteer work in Fort Collins, including the archives, which are now housed at the Fort Collins Museum. And I know she dabbled a bit at the Museo de las Tres Colonias mm -hmm. and the historic waterworks. So we're happy to have your expertise and have you here, Lucy. We're going to be discussing today the information from the book that Lucy recently wrote called People of the Poudre. It is an ethno-history of the Kashlapudur River National Heritage Area. That's a very big <laughs> mouthful. Uh, would you tell us first what, that, what an ethno-history is? Well, an ethno-history is usually the study of a people's history. And actually, this book is a little different. It's, an, it's a history of the people in an area, but you don't hear the word ethnogeography, so we decided we'd just stick with ethno-history. And the uh, designation of? Uh, National Heritage Area. Explain that for us. Well, National Heritage Areas are designated by Acts of Congress, and the Kashlapooter was designated in 1996. And it um, goes from Picnic Rock out to the confluence of the Pooter with the Platte. And it's really a um, quasi-government organization called uh, that brings together people from the public, people from local government agencies, um, local businesses, to preserve the cultural resources of the area. And the stretch of the river um, from Picnic Rock to the, to the Platte has a lot of um, original irrigation structures, so those need to be preserved. It was actually the site of um, some of the early irrigation law in the state of Colorado that now governs water law in the West. To the present day. To, to the present day. And so a lot of that happens here on the Poudre. And we're fortunate to have that activity and a lot of research um, into water management took place here. How do you measure how someone's gotten the water that they deserve and don't get more than that? Mm -hmm. So that's why this area was designated. And as part of their program, um, the management organization is the Poudre Heritage Alliance, they wanted some interpretive material and that's why they asked me to put this book together. I and see. they've done several other projects and they have a website that can provide more information. Excellent. So all that information is becoming available because of that act of Congress. Yes, yes. It's really exciting. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, as I read the information, I came across a new word. I just love yeah. it. Lifeways. Tell us what lifeways are. I suspect it'll <coughs> come up in our conversation today. It probably will. Lifeways are a way to talk about how people well, make a living is a little too strong a word, but how do they find their food? How do f they find the resources they need? How, what kind of shelters do they use? A good example, um, are they agriculturalists? Do they grow their food? Are they pastoralists? Do they herd animals? Or are they hunters and gatherers where they go out and hunt animals and gather plant products? Those would be life ways. I see. And so you, as you looked at the history yeah. of all the people yeah. who have mm -hmm. lived in this area, you were also trying to find out their life ways. That was really the big question. How did people get by when they were here on the Poudre River? With the, what was, was here. here. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, where did you find your information? I suspect you can't Google 12,000 <laughs> years of, of no. history of our area. No, Googling is probably <coughs> one of the fewest kinds of things I did. But I looked at really two information sources. Mm -hmm. I looked at the archaeological record which is very useful for the 12,000 year ago kind of stuff. And I also looked at our historical records. Diaries people have written, newspaper accounts, uh, summaries from military expeditions, that sort of thing. As much as I could find, I tried to go to what would be called primary research, things written at the time by the people who were there. Now, unfortunately, that only goes back so far in our area, and not very far at that. That goes back to maybe 1850. Okay. Um, af before that, it's all archaeology. And sources that you were able to use, their information came from um, archaeology again mm -hmm. and historical Heri records. Yeah, yes. I see. Um, are they all accurate? No, that's a real dilemma. Um, as we know, history is usually written by the winners. I'm not the first to say that, but I don't know who did. And we write things through our own lenses, our own filters. 
And if I'm a Euro-American, I write it with a certain perspective. That may not be the perspective of the Native Americans we want to know about. But since we don't have those folks here to ask, and they didn't get a chance to write it down, we only know what was written. So much of this history does have to be taken with a bit of a, a grain of salt to understand what the thoughts were at the time, what the attitudes were, and how those attitudes come through the history. So the history may be biased. <laughs> oh, very much so. And, but tell <coughs> us about archaeology. If you <coughs> find an arrow <coughs> point, then mm -hmm. you know that's accurate. Is that a perfect way to no. research? No. Archaeology also has its limitations and is also biased. Only the, the only things we actually find are things that preserve. So we won't find basketry. We won't find clothing if it's very old because it will have deteriorated. So we only get the things that preserve well. And what we, a, a very good example is um, our Folsom period people, which are 12,000 years old, give or take a bit. What we find from them are mostly places where they have killed animals because the animal bones preserve very, very well. Well, we know they had to be camping somewhere. We know they had to be doing other things, but those spots aren't preserved very well. So we don't know very much about those. So we have a bit of a biased view about what these folks were doing. They were out killing lots of animals. Well, they were, but they were also doing a whole lot of other things, and we just don't know as much about the other things. So you were <coughs> able to find as much as research as you could, but there are gaps. <laughs> oh, there are many gaps. <laughs> many gaps. Well, <coughs> let's um, talk about the area that you were researching, the mm -hmm. Cashlacuda River Basin, and um, the peoples who have lived here over those many mm -hmm. years had to make do with what was available yes. here along their environment. Tell us about the environment along the Cashlacuda. Well, for most of the last 12,000 years, it wasn't tremendously different than what we experience today climate-wise. Yes, we're seeing some global warming, but through history, there have been warm periods and colder periods. Before about 12,000 years ago, things were quite a bit different, and we'll just ignore that for now. Uh, the plants and animals, pretty similar. Um, we, of course, are missing bison today, which would have been present for most of that period. We also see, I think, a much more lush environment because of irrigation. Uh, before settlers came, this area would have been much drier. The only trees you would have seen would have been along the rivers and some of the, the stream drainages. So today you look out and you see a very treed kind of valley, and I think that's changed a lot. So when those <coughs> wagon trains came across, just a few <laughs> cottonwoods right next just to a the very, river. Just a very <laughs> few cottonwoods. And in fact, the council tree, which many people are familiar with, was, was known as a, the large tree along the river. Now today, you wouldn't necessarily be able to pick out the large tree along the river because there's so many of them and so many in, the, in town and along the river all the way to, to Greeley. But early inhabitants <coughs> had learned to use the resources that were here. Oh, yes, yes. Well, you have um, divided the history of this area into five periods. Let's yeah. define those um, periods real quickly, quickly and then we can talk about each one. Um, the Paleo-Indian um, period from 12,000 B.C. to 5,500 B.C. Mm -hmm. And um, the Archaic period from 5,500 to 150 A.D. Tell us why you made the break off at 5,500. Well, Linda, I thought you might ask that question. And actually, just to clarify, I, these are not my partitionings. Oh, these are the partitionings of um, the Colorado Council of Professional Archaeologists for the state of Colorado in the Platte area. Um, there's a, a, an extensive volume on prehistory of our area that I drew some of these broader pieces of information from. And so these are, if you're going to talk about northern Colorado or northeastern Colorado, these would be the kind of the buckets you would use. <coughs> and to get back to your question about Paleo-Indian versus Archaic, the distinction is not very clear. Um, as we get more information about Paleo-Indian period people and Archaic people, there wasn't a big, one day you're one and the next day you're another. Not at all. Uh, generally, we've looked at archaic people as using more ground stone tools, such as this I've brought in, where they were processing bones and, and seeds, where they might be um, pounding something to break it down or grinding. We see an intensification of that in the archaic, but perhaps they were doing it in the Paleo-Indian period as well. We see shelters starting to show up in the archaic, and we see very sh few shelters in the Paleo-Indian period, but some of those are turning up as well. So what we originally thought, Paleo-Indian people were highly mobile, moved around the landscape a lot from here to, say, Texas. So when I say a lot, I mean a lot. Um, hunting large animals. Well, it's not clear they only hunted large animals, and they may not have been that mobile. 
in the archaic period, we, s we think people settled down a little bit more, didn't range quite as far, and used a broader category of resources, brought in more deer, more small animals like rabbits, used more seeds, more berries, more roots, and more processing of those foods. I see. But again, it wasn't a clear distinction. Mm. Uh, the it's other gradual. thing, it's very gradual, and the other thing that we've used to demarcate the two periods are a change in projectile points. Um, quite large projectile points in the Paleo-Indian period and quite a bit smaller during the Archaic. So that's more of just a, an identifier, but it doesn't really say that people were doing things a lot differently. Mm -hmm. uh, this takes a lot less material to make. I so see. one might want to do this rather than this. Mm -hmm. But that could, that could be the simple explanation. And they might not have actually been doing anything really different. We just don't know. They didn't, they didn't send us a videotape. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It down. No one wrote it down. And then it moves from archaic to ceramic, <laughs> and my mind says that ceramic has to do with pottery. Yes. Is that the case? Yes and no. And again, we have a dilemma here in northeastern Colorado. Our climate is so dry, we really can't um, support unirrigated agriculture. As we see when we drive out in the summer, we see the irrigation things over the cornfields. Mm -hmm. And so in our area, compared to areas to the east along the Mississippi and um, eastern Nebraska and Kansas, we never really had a true ceramic period. But because of the time matches those ceramic periods, we call it that I here see. anyway. We had minimal making of pottery. Um, if you're a mobile gathering group, carrying around pottery is a hazardous kinds of, kind of way to store your goods because your ceramics can break. In the ceramic era periods, um, areas to the to the east, we also see villages and agriculture, and those are really the marks of a shift into ceramic period. But we don't have those markers here. We have a little bit of pottery, not very specialized pottery, and it looks kind of crude. But we just we throw those folks into the ceramic period as well. We think there was a population increase during that period, so so mobility was reduced even more because of pressure by groups nearby. Oh, I see. They yeah. got hemmed in. They got hemmed in. The next <coughs> period was from 1540 to 1860, the proto-historic. Okay. That means I, the historic <laughs> part I get, proto, before. Am proto right? is before history. Uh -huh. And history really starts an area when there's people there who are going to write Maybe down the history. So we can go back and read history. Um, it's a bit of a misnomer to say our historic period started in 1540 when there were people like Coronado who arrived here and started making records. He arrived in Texas, excuse me, <coughs> he arrived in Texas in 1540, but no one really arrived in Colorado until about 1850 to make written records. So our history starts in 1860. So the period between 1540 and 1860 is called the Proto-Historic Period because with that arrival of Coronado, we actually have European contact. Goods are starting to be traded through Texas into New Mexico, so we start to see metal showing up in places away from where Co Coronado actually is. We also see the transmission of European diseases, and that's fairly major. So we start to see influences of the Europeans in this proto-historic period, even though no one's around to write the history itself. And so that's what really separates the proto-historic period from the subsequent historic period and from the prior ceramic period. It's this introduction of European goods. And that's kind of a unique phenomenon to, to the Americas. Uh, you wouldn't see that same kind of um, influence in Europe, for example, mm -hmm. or it's happening at a much different time. And our historic period, as you said, mm -hmm. begins about 1860 because that's when Euro-Americans actually came right here. Came to here. our Cache La Poudre area. Yeah. So the historic period actually starts at different times in different places. Understandably. It would have started in 1540 in Texas. Uh -huh. So uh, another 300 years later, we have our historic period. Once the historic records are being kept and people mm -hmm. are recording, writing things down, then are you sure that your research is accurate? I, sorry to keep going back to this, no, but I it seems so important as you were doing yeah. your research. I think it's a very important concept to have in mind that history is written, history is not a videotape. When you videotape, you get what occurred. History is written by what people recall, what they're asked to recall, what they want to recall, and also what they, they experienced in their own right. Mm -hmm. So no one can experience everything. No one remembers everything. Everyone has a little bit of a, gee, I'd rather not talk about that. Um, so those things don't get written in our history. 
Absolutely. Well, then let's go back um, to those periods and tell, I, you've told yeah. a lot of the really important things, but let's just make sure we haven't missed any a very exciting mm -hmm. things. Back to the Paleo right. Indians, um, what was their culture like? Well, we really don't know much about their culture if we use culture to include language, yes. religion, organizational structure, because all we really have left from them are their projectile points, um, some bones that were butchered when they killed animals, and a very few what appear to be shelters. So we really know nothing about their belief systems, mm -hmm. um, their larger culture. Yeah. But we believe, based on what we found, that they were very mobile hunters and gatherers, and mostly hunters, less so gatherers. What they gathered was probably quickly processed and eaten and didn't require a lot of um, work to make it usable. Do you have any sense of how many people were here at that period of time? That's no one does. No one really does. Mm -hmm. um, we're fortunate here in Fort Collins in northern Colorado to have the Folsom Lindenmeyer campsite um, nearby because that's one of the largest campsites that's been found from that era, roughly 12,000 years ago again. And there we find some needles. We find some beads. We so find some things that look like game pieces. So, you know, when you start to find those kinds of things, you're thinking clothing, possibly some sort of tent-like shelter if they're using needles. Game pieces imply some sort of personal entertainment or group entertainment. Beads, again, some ornamentation. But we don't find a whole lot of these. And it doesn't look like there, even though it was a large camp, large is probably maybe 100 people, maybe 50 people. And we don't know that they were all there at one time, if they weren't you know, coming, because it was a great place to camp. Uh, mm -hmm. Water, mm -hmm. uh, some stone or lithic materials to make tools. Uh, at the time, it was a, a green, marshy kind of area, so there would have been a lot of animals to hunt. So it would be a great place to go stop by and Absolutely. hang out for a little while. So even if they were very mobile, they probably came back there quite yes, often. Yes, yes. That is, has been a wonderful resource for the history of oh, our area. It's, it's it? really exciting. And it belongs to the city of it Fort Collins now. I've, no, that's yeah, a difficult decision to make, but one that I think will stand the test of time. Absolutely. Yeah. That's very exciting. And then as we move into archaic and ceramic, the yeah. same is pretty much true, isn't it, that there aren't too many hints around? So Yeah, we um, again find butchered animals, mm -hmm. we find campsites, we find, um, as time moves forward, we find more shelters, particularly rock shelters with remains um, there that tell us a little bit mo more about what people did. But pretty much they were hunting and gathering. That's what you could do Absolutely. here. But then when we get to proto-historic and historic, then we're talking about the Euro-Americans starting yes. to have their influence. Yeah. Let's talk about how that began. With Coronado, okay. you said that trading began almost as early as the Euro-Americans appeared. Yeah, and certainly um, Coronado didn't come with the intent to trade necessarily, but um, trade did go on. And it's pretty easy to see if I'm having to make my projectile points out of stone, where it may take me 15 minutes to make a stone tool if I'm pretty good. If I can get a metal arrow point that doesn't break, that's going to be something I want to get. I want more of those. If I can get a steel pot to cook my food as opposed to a buffalo bladder or a leather bag or even a ceramic pot, that's got some real appeal. If I can get a metal axe instead of a large stone, um, you know, these are things I want to trade for. I want to have those. And Coronado, um, although they brought horses, they don't think really horses were introduced until quite a bit later. But again, a horse, gee, I can carry almost twice as much, well, over twice as much on a horse than I can pack myself or that my dogs can pack. So horses, I want some horses. These are good things. And I can move much faster. So I can go from here to there, carrying more things. Um, all so to in benefit. relative terms, that happened very quickly very over qu history. Very quickly over history. <coughs> um, the other thing that Coronado and subsequent Europeans brought was diseases. And as things are traded from person to person, those diseases were also transferred. And unfortunately, our Native American people did not have resistance to these diseases. And rather than just becoming ill, we saw a lot of death. Mm -hmm. And devastation of the whole group of people as there weren't yeah. people to carry on the traditions. Yes. Um, there weren't <coughs> even people to care for the sick, so many were ill. Yeah, and I, I think that is underrepresented in some of our history. The, the just devastating impact that I think this disease, these diseases had, measles, cholera, tuberculosis, influenza, smallpox, 
when they hit these groups, they didn't just take out the young children, they took out cross sections of the population. Elders were lost, elders with knowledge of the landscapes they lived in, uh, how to get by when things were tough, where we should go during the drought year. Uh, uh, caregiving mothers were lost, so now how do the babies survive? Uh, elder grandparents, um, grandmothers were lost, so now who tends the children while the mother goes out and gathers the roots, gets the water, etc. Um, and if you really can't even take care of those daily needs of getting food and getting water, you're, you're losing also the ability to man manage organization and cultural transmission. That was a huge impact, wasn't it? So oh, huge. I think they, those people are still suffering from that today. Perhaps so. Yeah, the, the legacy continues because mm -hmm. it's so difficult to, to get it back since those, those, that knowledge was not recorded anywhere. It's very difficult to retain. So trade <coughs> made some changes. Disease made huge mm -hmm. changes. Uh, what about um, bison? <laughs> ah. There's a big change. <laughs> oh, yes. Well, if you're a mobile hunter and gatherer and you yes. rely on bison as your primary um, food source, which many of the, the groups starting in about the mid-1700s did, when they became mounted hunters, bison procurement was a whole lot easier. And they relied on bison for the leather, the, the meat, of course. I mean, that's just a given, but all sorts of other things. Use the bones, use the hide use the sinew, et cetera, et cetera. So getting bison was extremely important. But as Americans came out and hunted the bison, and as bison meat actually became a commodity that was sold back east, and so you had American hunters selling back and also native hunters selling back, as well as the buffalo robes, our bison were completely decimated. Uh, I think the last bison seen near Fort Collins was in 1864 or something. Mm -hmm. Well, if that's what you rely on, and there's nothing to replace it. A deer is nowhere near a bison. <laughs> um, even an elk is not the same thing. These people really had no way to, to continue their life way or to make a living. Um, they were not necessarily given land and given um, beef or given flour as the government treaties had in many cases um, intended. And so these folks really were stuck. During that time when they were needing to move on mm -hmm. because they were, their life way was being yeah. threatened. So one local name that uh, everyone who studied the history seems to know is Chief Friday. Mm -hmm. you want to talk about him for a minute? Well, it, Chief Friday is kind of an interesting um, case because he's one of the only people we know about. <laughs> so exactly. everyone knows about him. <laughs> yeah, and whether he was, you know, a, a really somehow unique individual, we have no way to know because we don't know that much about other individuals. But he was, um, the histor his history is pretty well known, that he was adopted by Thomas Fitzpatrick in the 1840s, taken back to St. Louis where he learned English, both written and spoken English. He came back and joined his Arapaho people um, as a teenager, I believe and remained kind of in this Poudre area. But we have records of him taking his group up into Wyoming and all over the place. And he always wanted to establish a reservation here along the Poudre, and that never really panned out as we know today. <coughs> but he was, again, one of the few people we really know about because he was able to communicate with the whites who were around him in English. And he was quite a well-known person and um, a fairly colorful figure. And probably able to bridge the gap in, yes. in many ways yeah. because of his English um, language. Yeah. And yeah. Chief Left Hand spoke English as well. Yes. He was yeah. new to me. I'm ah. glad. <laughs> At least we have one other person who yeah. was uh, a compatriot of Chief Friday. Yeah, uh, Chief Left Hand was also an Arapaho. Uh, as the Arapaho tribe split into a northern and southern unit, uh, Chief Friday became a northern Arapaho and Chief Left Hand became a southern Arapaho. So their ways parted a bit, not because of any sort of personal um, animosity or anything, but the southern Arapaho reservation was established in Oklahoma and the northern Ra Arapaho reservation eventually ended up in Wyoming. So they sort of went their separate ways. But Chief Left Hand also used the Poudre River for um, hunting and grazing of horses and that sort of thing. And we know, again, a little bit more about him because he was able to talk to yes. the English speakers around him. 
Uh, he was also fairly instrumental in trying to maintain the peace between Arapaho and, and whites during the, the turbulent 1860s, as was Chief Friday. Thank heavens. <laughs> yeah. Well, talk generally about the relationships between right here in this part mm -hmm. of the country mm -hmm. between the natives who had been here and the Euro-Americans who were arriving. How generally did they feel about <coughs> one another? Well, that's a really interesting question. Again, here's where the history becomes a little... Um, biased. <laughs> biased, yeah, and, and possibly doesn't reflect the situation. Mm -hmm. um, if you go back and you read some of the Rocky Mountain News items, um, there's a lot of Indian fear and Indian scare in the 1860s. Many of those events um, are not well-founded. Some are, some aren't. Um, with the test of time, looking back, you know, what can we say? We, we weren't there, we don't know. But there is a lot of inflammatory reporting. And I think that possibly made the situation worse. But at the same token, if you are on the, the Native American side and, and you lost many of your people through disease, you're having a hard time procuring food, you're going to be angry. And now you have people coming in and taking your land. Your prime camping spot along the river now has someone's cabin on it. And in theory, your chiefs negotiated a treaty that said that land was yours, and these people aren't being kicked off. What's going on? So tensions ran high. But we really don't have any record of any sort of um, <coughs> white and Native American conflicts here along the Poudre. So the fear may have been more an emotional issue than a true fear. Mm -hmm. At the same time, there were some who are, I think, exploiting that Indian scare, um, bandit kind of people, who said, oh, if I disguise myself as a Native American or whatever, they'll think I'm one of those guys and blame them, and I get off with my goodies. So there were certainly bad individuals that were... Even the governor was, oh, was the governor. kind of <laughs> raising hackles, wasn't he? Well, uh, yeah, John Evans in this 1860s period had a real motivation to get all the Native Americans out to foster economic development and use the land well. Uh, gold was being found in the hills and certainly around Cherry Creek. And they wanted to get the goodies. Mm -hmm. And so to get the goodies, they wanted to push out the people who were already there. Right. So the newcomers wouldn't be frightened as they were coming to yeah. Colorado. Yeah. And, and that there would be no discussion about whose it is. Well, we're here. We got it. Unfortunately, there wasn't a place for the folks who were here to go. To stay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, the last section of your book, I think, says it wonderfully when you chose this quote. Maps are about power. The rich, powerful, and victorious determine place names just as they write history. The final defeat, defeat for losers is when they are wiped off the map. As you yeah. began your book, you said that there are no Native American names in, uh, on our state maps, no rivers, towns, mountains, not none, <laughs> but almost none. Yeah. And so the victorious are here today. Well, and, and particularly I said that about the, the Poudre corridor. Um, there's certainly, you know, we have Arapahoe County and Cheyenne County and so forth. So we have it a little bit further away, but in our area we seem to have erased those memories. Uh, in, the 1870, in 1878, all the Native Americans were required to move to a reservation, and as we know, we have no reservations no. Um, anywhere close. Uh, in Colorado, the only reservation is the Ute Reservation in the southwestern corner. So anyone who was here ended up in Wyoming or South Dakota or Oklahoma or very possibly over in, on the Ute Reservation. But so essentially, we wipe the we slate clean, clean for many, many years. The memories are gone. The memories are gone. But Lucy, you've helped us bring the mm -hmm. memories back today. I want to thank you so very, very much for sharing your vast knowledge with us oh, on my, living history. My pleasure.